Hi, my name's Mark Fulcher, and in this webinar, I'm going to help give you some tips uh, about how to run a telehealth consultation. Um, when I talk to people about uh, doing talks, I encourage them only to talk about things that they're experts about. Um, and I wouldn't really classify myself as a telehealth expert, um, but it is something that I've been doing for about a year. Um, and I've spent a lot of time and energy in over the last week uh, trying to get my own clinic set up uh, for telehealth. So uh, I think what I'm going to share with you is some practical tips about how I run a consultation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the limitations associated with telehealth consultations and how you may be able to minimize those. Um, and then just generally about the process, how this might work at your, uh, your own clinic uh, for your own patients. So the first thing I'd like to tell you a little bit about my clinic. We run over three sites. Uh, two of those are in Auckland in New Zealand. Um, and the other one is in Queenstown, which is uh, at the geographical end of the country, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with New Zealand. Um, and so for us, it's very important to be able to keep up in contact uh, with our other clinic um, and make sure that we're able to offer care for patients in both sites. So telehealth has been quite a useful medium for that. When we first started to do this type of consultation, the majority of the consultations were very brief. Um, it was following up results, and most of those were done over the phone. We then moved to a, a different platform using uh, things like Zoom or Skype, um, which are encrypted and are totally appropriate for telehealth in some situations. Uh, but more recently, we've moved to a, a custom telehealth solution, and we were hoping to be in, in six months is having that built into our patient management software. So that's, that's kind of where we've been prior to this COVID-19 situation. Um, but obviously things have had to change very quickly for us, uh, and I'm sure they have for you as well. Um, I guess what I'm going to talk about now is how our clinic has adapted and how we've implemented a telehealth uh, solution. And the first thing I'd say to all, all of you out there, all of you contemplating uh, starting to perform this type of consultation is um, keep a good attitude. This is a new thing for you. It's a new thing for your patients. Um, you haven't used the technology before, you haven't really considered often how these consultations might run, and so you're going to have to start um, changing your practice very, very quickly, and I think it's, it's inevitable that things won't be perfect. A good example is around the telehealth platform itself. Um, these platforms on a good day are not perfect, um, and you may spend a lot of time and energy getting your internet connection to be good, making sure that you understand how to use the platform well. But just remember on the other end of the consultation is your patient who uh, possibly has never considered this and uh, has other things in their day that they've uh, prioritized. So the consultation will not always go smoothly. And if you don't go into it with a, a resilient attitude and a positive attitude, I think that you're probably setting yourself up to fail. As I sort of alluded to before, um, telehealth consultations can be conducted in a variety of different ways. Um, and conducting a, a conversation over the telephone can still be a useful way of relaying Im important information. So for example, we might be able to communicate the results of, uh, of some investigation findings. We might be able to talk to them about uh, how their treatment is going. Are they on the improve? What's happening to their pain? Um, but it is a relatively limited way uh, to communicate. And I guess a lot of you uh, will be physiotherapists, and so we really need to think about how we're going to be able to offer a viable service, and for you, um, being able to show them some exercise uh, and be able to help them with their rehabilitation is going to be an important uh, part of the consult. And so a video uh, component is essential. Um, at the simplest level, using something like Zoom or Skype uh, is a good idea. Um, the consultation, uh, you can share your own screen, you can show, uh, the patient can share their own screen, um, and most of you will be familiar with the functionality within those types of platforms um, because you have used them in other areas of your life. Um, taking it from there, there are some custom-built uh, telehealth solutions, and there are a lot of them. So when you're starting to have a look out there and consider whether one of these might work for you, um, make sure you spend some time having a look at the different functionality. Um, we've gone for one at our clinic called doxy.me, predominantly because there's a really good free option, um, and so you can log in and have, uh, have a try and see whether you think the solution might work for you. 
Um, and the other main reason, it's very, very simple. And so we can send a link out to our patients. The patients can click on that link, which takes them to a web browser, um, and they don't have to download anything else. Um, and so uh, it's very, very simple for the patient. As I alluded to, there are some patient management softwares, uh, software programs that have these uh, functionalities built into them, uh, and they are definitely the way to go if you see yourself doing this uh, on an ongoing or enduring way. Um, but for most of you, um, having never really considered telehealth before and having to really get into this very quickly, um, I think you might want to go for one of those more simple solutions. I'm going to uh, just stop the talk now and show you a little bit about how our platform works, um, which will involve me clicking around a little bit. So um, this is the screen that I have. Um, it's, uh, as you can see, you got my name up here. This is uh, the link that I send to my patients, or I can have my PA send to my patients, and I can send it to them in a variety of different ways. Um, when a patient arrives, I can see that they've checked in here, and I can see how long they've been there. Um, and I'm just going to show you a link that I've sent myself so we can see what the patient sees. So this is the email that has come out from my PA. I click on the link here. Um, and if you stand by, I'm going to type my details in. and check in. And so the, the program can be customized uh, so that when the patient checks in, they can see uh, that I who I am. Um, they can find out a little bit about how to use the consultation. These are all customizable. Um, there's a small video from the provider about how to use the consultation um, and some instructions about what to do if they're uh, not satisfied with how things are going. I'm just going to mute my audio so that I don't get any uh, bad feedback. Um, but you can see on, on my screen here that there's someone in the waiting room and I've been waiting for less than a minute and I'm going to start a call. So I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to run this uh, with both the patient and the doctor um, so that you can see what's going on. So this is currently what I'm going to see as a patient and this is uh, what I see as a doctor which is confusing because I can see myself. So um, from within the consultation, I can do a variety of different things. So I can obviously talk to the patient uh, and I can explain uh, about what's happening during the consultation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how I run my consultations in a moment. Um, but there are some other things that I can do. One is share my screen, um, which is very useful if you want to show the patient some radiology. Um, or if you want to show them uh, some exercises that you might have up open on your screen. Um, the other thing is that I can send them some uh, files, so things like a prescription, uh, something like um, a radiology report. These can all be uploaded and shared in a secure platform with the patient, so you don't need to have uh, a less secure way of con uh, conversation with them uh, like an email. So uh, that's the platform that we're using. They're all very similar, but this one uh, is easily, easily customizable. We're waiting for our logo to be added into here and have all of our colors. Um, but obviously they're pretty busy, I would imagine, right now with uh, the rest of the world trying to figure out how to run these consultations. So uh, there's a variety of different platforms, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the next thing, you really need to consider how your setup is going to work for you. So for many of your practices, you need to find a solution very, very quickly. And I think communicating that to your clinicians and also to your administrative team is really, really important. And like any other technology, there's going to be a learning curve. So uh, for, for us, we decided uh, at the beginning of the week that this was how we were going to go. We cancelled all of our patients on the Monday and moved to a telehealth solution. Um, then uh, by Tuesday, most of our clinicians were up and running using uh, the web portal. And by Wednesday, our clinics were full and we were running uh, exclusive clinics on telehealth. Um, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that there are going to be problems. So uh, we had a weekly or an end of the day um, uh, consultation or phone with all of our, with our team to see what had gone well and what hadn't gone well. 
we've set up a WhatsApp group and so we're communicating with each other about things, problems and solutions when we find them. So I think it's unrealistic to expect that you're providing some information once um, and uh, that your team is going to be able to get up and running. One of the key things I think when you're running a consultation with your patient is to be really clear about the limitations of the consultation and to acknowledge those. So I think where problems arise is when you maybe try and overstep the boundaries of, of what the consultation uh, allows you. So, so for some patients, you really need to make sure that you are performing a clinical examination. Some patients, their problem is very complex. And so the probability of being able to resolve that properly um, within a telehealth conversation is fairly limited. What I think you can do is get the conversation started. Um, so we can make some form of action plan. Um, and at the moment, I think you need to realize that your patients don't have another easy solution. And their option is to go to an emergency department where frankly, most of them don't want to go. Uh, and quite frankly, the, the emergency department staff don't want these patients in their emergency room at the moment. So initiating a, a, a plan and initiating an assessment, I think is very appropriate, but explaining to the patient that we may need to get them back um, if need be, making sure that you're referring them to the emergency department if you think that their problem is uh, time sensitive um, or referring them on, uh, say, for a specialist opinion um, or to their GP uh, where appropriate. So I think don't uh, try and do something that the technology does not allow you to do. To try and illustrate that, I'm going to show you uh, two patients that I saw earlier this week. Um, the first was a 24-year-old who had a classic history for a hemarthrosis, so a twisting, pivoting injury during football, they felt a pop, they had their knee rapidly swell, and they were very sore. So this is a classic patient where you can make a really good diagnosis through the history. Um, examining them is more challenging. Um, my approach to the examination of this guy was to get him up and to walk him, and I could see he had an antalgic gait. I could get him to show me his knee range of motion and saw that he had a loss of extension of about 10 degrees and he could only flex up to about 90 degrees. So he clearly was quite restricted. I could see that he had a large effusion. Um, I asked him to palpate his own knee and he could show me that he had tenderness around the lateral aspect of his knee. Um, and I asked him to do a patella apprehension test, which he was actually quite good at. Um, and that was not very provocative. So it made me think even more that he'd torn his ACL. So within that examination, I feel that I made quite a robust diagnosis, um, but again, acknowledging the limitations to him that in order to, to make that, exam, uh, that diagnosis for sure, I'd need to examine him at some point. I then spoke with him about his options for treatment and my uh, suggestion was that we started some rehabilitation we get him in touch with a physiotherapist who is also uh, operating via telehealth while uh, we're all on our lockdown. Um, but I did also offer him the option of uh, further evaluating his knee because we can uh, access MRI scans, we can access x-rays. Um, and he decided that that was how he wanted to approach this because he wanted to get the process underway. So the probability of having an elective surgical procedure, assuming we did prove an ACL deficient knee, um, is very, very low in the next month or two. But if we can get the ACC paperwork, the insurance pre-approval, um, those sorts of things, he was very motivated to get underway. And uh, our radiology partner, ARG, uh, are operating at the moment with some fairly strict um, protocols. So that is how we decided to manage this guy. Um, if we contrast this to uh, my next patient, who is a 44-year-old who came with quite significant uh, arm pain, um, his arm pain sounded very uh, like cervical radiculopathy. Um, his examination was challenging. I could see that he had grossly normal motor function. He could show me that he had altered sensation over the radial border of his thumb um, and, uh, sorry, his thumb and the radial border of his forearm. Um, and I could also see that he had a limited cervical range of motion and he had pain with Sperling's test. So I explained to him that he uh, appeared to have cervical radiculopathy. I explained the limitations of my consultation and that I couldn't uh, define his strength uh, as well as I would like. I couldn't test his reflexes. But I also explained to him that with the symptoms that he had, even if he had some weakness, 
I don't think there was any indication to, to uh, treat that as an emergency. Um, we really focused hard on trying to get some good pain relief um, and we sent him out a, a prescription for that. And we also talked about the pros and cons of imaging um, and I talked with him about an MRI scan, particularly in light of the opportunity to have a foraminal injection. Um, but after a, a discussion, we decided that he didn't want to have an MRI scan, he didn't want to consider an injection, um, and he didn't really want to leave his home. And I, uh, I really understand those decisions and don't think we're compromising his care. But again, we arranged some careful follow-up so that we can see how he's going, make sure his symptoms are improving, and make sure there's no deterioration. So again, a limited consultation, but I think by uh, making some sensible decisions uh, about what the likely outcomes of that problem are has allowed us to mitigate that risk. Um, I alluded to it, but when you're not sure whether you're doing the right thing, arranging to see the patient again, either through another telehealth consultation or in person, um, I think is going to be a very important next step. Um, this week, we're only seeing people by telehealth, um, but next week we're setting up some acute clinics. So patients with more significant need, potentially the, this guy with cervical radiculopathy and a lot of pain, he is going to come back, or he potentially could back, come back and see us in an acute clinic. Um, the patient with the knee problem will review his MRI scan when it's available via telehealth, but at some point we're going to need to see him physically in clinic to repeat his examination. So. I think a key thing here is don't overstep the mark, um, make sure you acknowledge the limitations of the technology and in situations where you feel that your consultation um, has been somewhat limited, then make sure that you're bringing the patient back. Um, we've talked so far about clinical processes, so uh, I think that those are probably what interest most of us the most, but remember in order for your clinic to be successful and for it to run smoothly, we really need to have good administrative processes as well. Um, and so simple things like how actually are we going to get our radiology referrals to our patients? How are we going to get a prescription to the pharmacy? Um, in our practice and in most uh, GP practices, um, there is still the routine use of faxes to send these, these paperwork to the, to the pharmacy. Um, our patient management software is on the server our telehealth solution at the moment does not work on the server. So there are some real logistical problems that we've had to overcome and I think working really closely with your admin team will make uh, the whole process much more rewarding um, and it's really important to resolve these things as much as you can up front. So spending some time with them, uh, making sure that your admin team is still available because if referrals and things are still coming in, you still need someone to deal with those and you need to make sure that your patients and your referrers understand how to get those uh, through to you. And in our practice, we're running uh, a normal referral system. So we absolutely want to continue to see patients. We have uh, phone numbers uh, deviated, uh, are deferred or deflected to our PAs who are working from home. So uh, from, the, from the outside, I hope it feels very much like we're running a normal service. Um, Billing is an important consideration, so the patient is not in front of you. Uh, in the New Zealand context, a lot of us uh, can claim directly from ACC or from other insurers, so there's less of a, a need to bill the patient. Um, but in some, some situations, you, you need to consider how you might collect a co-payment. Um, are you going to send out an invoice? Um, because I think that becomes quite logistically challenging. Um, and one of the advantages of these telehealth systems, uh, the one I showed you before particularly, um, it integrates with a program called Sky, uh, Stripe. So you can send an invoice directly through the consultation, um, which the patient can pay either during the consultation or after the consultation. So the system itself will help you do your billing. So um, it is a, you know, we're thinking a lot about how we continue to offer a clinical service but these administrative services are also very important. Um, one thing which I haven't touched on yet, but it's, it's a really key thing I think with this type of consultation is ensuring that the patient has consented to the consultation. Most of them, their only experience with these video platforms may have been talking to their friends or colleagues through Zoom or through Skype. 
Um, and so making sure that they understand that they are participating in a medical conversation um, and a medical consultation is really important. So when I start the consultation, I explain uh, that this is going to be a normal consultation. I explain that all the rules of our normal uh, consultations apply. Uh, and I ask them whether they're comfortable conducting the consultation online. The other thing that I think is important to remember is uh, who else is in the background of the call? Um, sometimes people uh, might ring in from their work not knowing what they're getting themselves into. Um, similarly at home, they may not want to share this consultation with their families. So making sure that there's no one in the background that the patient doesn't want, uh, I think is important too. Good practice, I think, is to uh, document in your clinical notes that you've obtained consent. Um, and another thing that I think is quite helpful is just to perform a check-in at the end of the consultation. Um, ask the patient whether they think the consultation has been good. Um, ask them whether they understand what you've talked about. Um, and basically ask them to raise any concerns that they may have had. So I think that's just good practice anyway, and it's, it's a nice way to wrap up the, the uh, consultation. Um, I think another thing that we really all need to consider is, are we actually essential services? So we're in the same boat as everybody else. Um, we want to be running a consultation. We want to be running our businesses. Um, but equally, we don't want to be spreading this virus around our communities. So um, our doctors, doctors are considered at the moment uh, essential services across the board. But I think a lot of our consultations, I think we'd be hard pressed to say that they were essential. So. Uh, the patient before with a, with a painful swollen knee, he was in pain, um, but he could have waited for a month to see me. Um, but we can offer the service from our homes, we can offer the service through telehealth, um, and I think that it's a, a good service to be able to offer because these patients do have some disability. What I'm saying is I think we need to minimize our exposure to the community and we need to think about the rules that are, have been put in place by the government and be quite clear that we're following those. So in our practice, we are running our business as usual referral practice to medical or orthopedic specialists. So we still want people to refer us. We still want GPs, physiotherapists, um, chiropractors to send us referrals. Um, we're also running an acute service for patients that aren't referred. Um, and we're talking with emergency departments and community EDs about deflecting patients uh, from those places to us. So. Um, we're trying to do our best as a clinic to help support the health system. So if there are increasing cases going into the ED, that we can provide a viable solution. Um, for those of you who are allied health providers out in the community, um, we're trying to get patients in as quick as we can. So patients that have need pain relief, um, we're trying to have uh, an acute appointments with our providers every day so we can help with that. Um, talking about imaging, talking about uh, injections. These are all things that we're trying to have on our radar. And as uh, the, the other thing I alluded to before is around um, how, um, I've lost my train of thought, um, what we do with patients that have time sensitive problems. So we are going to be running some limited face-to-face uh, -face, uh, consultations on a one in, one out kind of basis, minimizing time in waiting room, minimizing contact, um, but providing a hands-on service um, for patients that genuinely have need. So uh, that's something that we'll be uh, scaling up, I think, over the next week or two. Um, just a final couple of things. A lot of people, uh, so there's been quite an explosion of community-based ultrasound-guided injections. And so I just wanted to reinforce to you that there has been a suggestion um, that we should be avoiding some types of non steroidals particularly ibuprofen, um, but also corticosteroid injections um, during this crisis. Um, and the NHS in the UK has essentially banned the use of steroid injections. So we know that steroid injections do transiently lower immunity. And there have been some case reports, particularly of Nurofen, um, being associated with worse outcomes in young people who have contracted COVID-19. So I think when you're talking to patients, having an understanding that these may be a problem, um, it's not an evidence-based approach, so I can't say for sure that a steroid injection is going to make someone more likely to get COVID-19, but I think it's worth having a conversation. And I think if you are thinking about referring someone for an injection, you may want to send them through someone like us, 
uh, to help triage that, explain the, the consequences of that injection to your patients. The final thing I wanted to mention was around ultrasound. So if we think about referring patients for imaging, if you refer them for an x-ray, there's very limited contact with other people. So the radiographer can stay uh, fairly remote to the patient. They don't have to spend prolonged periods with them. The patient lies on the table, has the x-ray, and then leaves. If we're referring them for an MRI scan, it's very similar. Um, the MRI tech does not have to spend a lot of time with the, con with the uh, patient. And again, the radiology practice that we're using is working very hard to minimize all patient contact. If you contrast that with ultrasound, in order to do an ultrasound, you, the patient and the sonographer need to spend a fairly significant amount of time together and in quite close uh, contact. So I would encourage most of you, if you're thinking about imaging, think very carefully about whether you think an ultrasound scan is a good idea. Um, and I would have a low threshold to try and access an MRI scan. And that's where our acute clinics, I think, might be quite helpful for you. So if you think your patient needs more imaging, um, I would suggest referring them to us or referring them to an orthopedic surgeon in your region who you, who's able to see them quickly. Um, and then we can consider what type of imaging might be more appropriate for them. So I guess uh, in conclusion, hopefully that's been useful for you. So uh, that's a, a kind of practical approach to starting to get involved in telehealth um, and some of my thinking about how we might be able to run our consultations over the next few months um, while we may be uh, working from home or working from elsewhere. And I think the final thing I would say is while in New Zealand we have four weeks where we know we're going to be working from home, I think we need to be preparing ourselves for what next. So in some regions, I think four weeks might turn into eight weeks or 12 weeks. Um, I think also when we start returning to work in four weeks, if we do, um, we are going to think seriously about how we're going to protect ourselves and our patients from this virus. So I don't think the problem will be suddenly eliminated and you might need to be thinking about how uh, you order masks, what is your process around your waiting rooms, um, and potentially we could think about another webinar for those things later. So I hope that's been useful for you and stay tuned for more um, telehealth resources from the clinic later next week.